The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello and welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Caleb and today we're going to build a ruggedized offline Wikipedia and reference library on a Raspberry Pi. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. There are times you might find yourself in a situation where there's no internet access available to you. You could be camping, you're on extended travel, a zombie apocalypse, or maybe just a trip to your grandparents' house. Whatever the case may be, you still might need to look up a few things. And for that, we're going to use an open source software project called Kiwix. The software installs on a Raspberry Pi and provides an active Wi-Fi hotspot so you can connect your phone or your tablet and access the reference data. What sort of reference data? How about all of Wikipedia? With images. We're also going to throw in a dictionary, some learning resources, textbooks, and some medical data so you can patch up that zombie bite. It's going to be built into a ruggedized, weatherproof case with its own battery so it can easily and safely be transported while you're camping or thrown into the back of a truck in a bug out situation. It'll have a touch screen, some thermal regulation, and a few buttons because buttons are always awesome. Let's go over the design real quick and I'll show you what I have in mind. Much of the design for this project was done while I was shopping for parts. After I selected all of the electronic components, I started searching for a good enclosure for it. And that's when I started to envision how it would work. I decided to design 3D printed parts as a frame around the inside of the case so it would get glued to the sides. Then I could design top and bottom plates that will have the screen and the buttons, the fan and the pie and all of that. The plates will screw into the frame parts for easy maintenance access to the components inside. The Pi, power supply, and relay will mount directly to the bottom plate while the battery pack will get velcroed down to the bottom of the case itself. The battery pack has a status LED on the top which would be really nice to see. So I placed the fan directly above the LED on the battery pack so I could look down through the fan hole to see it. The air intake vents are on the opposite side of the Raspberry Pi from the exhaust fan so that the new cool air will be pulled across the surface of the Pi. The screen will be mounted to the top plate with a couple of pieces of aluminum channel. To get the correct mounting hole pattern in the aluminum channel for the display, I 3D printed two thin parts that had the holes in them already. I then double sided taped that to the channel and used it as a guide for my hand drill. That worked out great. Also the case is made from polypropylene, which most glues won't take to. I went with a special plastic bonder that will adhere to the polypropylene and the PLA. I didn't want to put any screws through the case so it would maintain its IP rating, whatever that may be. Now let's have a look at the parts and then we'll install Kiwix right after. Running this whole project is going to be a Raspberry Pi 4 with a 128 gig SD card in it. The way Kiwix works is that they want to have all of the data on the SD card itself. Wikipedia is 80 gigs alone and there's a bunch of other stuff that I want to get on there. They don't really have native support for putting data on an external drive, but I figured out a way to do it. So if we need more space, I've got some USB drives around and we'll use one of those. To view everything, we've got the official Raspberry Pi 7-inch touchscreen display. The project doesn't really need this because Kiwix provides an active hotspot on the Pi, but I thought it would be good redundancy just in case your phone breaks or you lose it or whatever. Since this is more of an appliance type of a project, I wanted to have intelligent control over the power. And for that, we're gonna try this Pi Supply Switch version 1.1. It's a pass-through board, so power goes in one side and comes out the other. And when you hit a button on it, it will send a shutdown command to the Raspberry Pi and shut everything down gracefully. There's another button, you hit that, and it will power the system up by flipping the relay on it. I haven't tried one of these, so we'll see how it goes, but it does come as a kit, so we'll solder that up here in a minute. Again with these ITW switches, I really do love them, and I keep them in my Element 14 shopping cart so I can get back to them quick. The other reason I keep using them is that I already have the dimensions and the specs and the CAD models and hole sizes and physical experience. I know how much force it takes to push them down. I know what they're made out of, what materials, it's hard plastic and metal. 
And that means that I can plan and prototype that much faster and not have to worry about hunting down the right switch or the new part, make sure the data sheet's correct and all of that stuff. So work smarter, right? And this thing needs to be rugged, so we're gonna put it in this. I own several of the high-end major branded plastic equipment cases very similar to this and they are very expensive. I found this one on Element 14. It's a brand called Duratool and I thought I'd give it a test drive. The only thing I didn't like about it when I was specking it is that there was no mention anywhere of what its IP rating is. It's clearly an IP68 or 69 enclosure, but it just doesn't specify. We'll see. For a battery, I found a 10 amp hour power bank by Multicomp Pro from Element 14. It was very affordable and I should be able to get about 10 or 12 hours of runtime out of the Raspberry Pi, display, and even the fan. And it'll probably get pretty warm in that box running a Raspberry Pi for that long. And you know me, I like to overbuild stuff. So I'm going to add a temperature sensor and a fan to switch on the fan at some yet undetermined temperature. And instead of pulling power directly from the Pi, I want to pull it from the power bank itself. So I have a little relay board that we're going to use to do that. This little fan will pull 7.1 cubic feet per minute. And I did the math on the box. It should move the air through that thing 50 times a minute with this. All right, to install Kiwix, head on over to kiwix.org. Click on download, go down to hotspot, click more. And this is a little bit different than a normal Raspberry Pi installer. There's no image file to download. You download an installer and it will package up and create the image for you on your desktop. You can just download an image and it creates it for you. This is 10 bucks, I've never used it, but it supports the project and that's pretty cool. So if you wanna do that, go ahead and do that. If you're more adventurous, come on down, click on whatever operating system you have here and it will download a file, it's about 250 megs. I already have it downloaded, I'm gonna run it it's going to extract, and here are the options. So it's got a hotspot name, put in whatever you're gonna use. Uh, as options for some other stuff, we're gonna ignore that. Select your language. I'm gonna leave this as open Wi-Fi. If you want to encrypt and have a secure Wi-Fi, select that. We're not gonna cover that here, but you can read about it. Select your time zone. Put in admin password and username if you want. I haven't found a place to use that, so it doesn't seem that necessary. Build path is the next important thing here. It's going to build the image, so it's going to need a space on your draw on a drive that has a, enough space to build the image. So I'm going to select something I already have set up here, and then select the SD card. There's my 128 gig SD card. It tells me that I've got 110 gigs left after it installs the Raspbian operating system. The next part is to select the static content. So click select, another window pops up, embiggen that, and then it's, it shows all of this for everything in every language. We're gonna go down and select our language, which for me it is English and then go through and find all of these things. There's a short description, it tells you how big it is, and then down here is how much free space you have. So once you double click on one of these and it puts it down here, it will show you what is remaining. So I'm gonna do that, stand by, and we'll be back when that's done. Okay, that took about 10 minutes, but I think I have managed to get everything that I want on here that seems to be important. Anything in the kind of a survival aspect, you know, amateur radio stuff, bioinformatics, lots of medical, uh, coffee. I don't know what this content is, but it says people interested in all aspects of producing and consuming coffee. So maybe some information on how to roast coffee. Uh, earth sciences, engineering, gardening, home brewing, that will be important. Math, lots of math. Lots of medical, pets, physical fitness, physics, all kinds of good stuff. Once you get that all selected, click done and click run installation. 
and make sure you have that much free space. Now it's gonna open up this window and run forever, really. It's gonna take a long time because it's gonna download all of that, put it into a, onto your drive, and then assemble it into an image file. So go get a good cup of coffee, sit down, drink it, take a nap, come back, and we'll continue. Now, really, once this is done, there will be an image file. You just take that and write it to a drive. I think it does that. I think it does it. It's gonna write it to the SD card. If not, use something like Etcher to write it to the SD card. And that's it, really, for the installation of Kiwix. And once it's once you pop it in the Raspberry Pi and fire it up, it will automatically create a hotspot. You connect to that hotspot. And I'll show you how to do that because it wasn't very straightforward the first time I did it. And then you're up and running. So once this is done, we'll move on to the next part. Hi, my name is James and this is my electronics workbench. Together, we host Workbench Wednesdays. It is a show where I review electronics tools and equipment. Whether you are on a hobbyist budget or trying to equip a professional workstation, we've got you covered. Look for new episodes on Wednesdays and come connect with me at element14.com slash workbench Wednesdays. All right, demo time. Let's open it up and have a look. It's gonna auto log in and automatically boot to the X Windows environment. In the Chromium browser, that's got the hotspot page already loaded up. Well, there it is. Bunch of reference data here. We saw a little bit earlier all of the things that I selected in the installer, and now you can see them here. So let's take a look at something. Uh, robotics looks fun. Why are Mars rovers so slow? This is a stack exchange. You can get into any one of these. See the question and all the answers on stack exchange. It even has all the graphics that come with it. Let's go back and check out the main bit of reference data, which is Wikipedia. And supposedly, it's all here. I mean, that's a whole bunch of data. It's 80 gigs worth of stuff. And I guess you just really have to search through it to find anything that you want. I mean, let's check that out. So there's no keyboard here, but I did install a virtual keyboard, which when you push this button, comes up and then you can type in there. So I don't know, what do you search for on the internet? Cat. There it is. So we'll get rid of the keyboard, push this button again. There it goes. And here's the Wikipedia article on the domestic cat. As you can see, all the images are along with it. Pretty cool. So the next thing to look at is the actual hotspot on a Wi-Fi device. Let's get that set up on my phone. I already have it up. So let's check 
make sure that we're connected to the Wi-Fi, not Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. See a list of all of the Wi-Fi's around. We're connected to APOC Pi, unsecured network. You can see we'll connect to local one here and then connect to that again. All right. Now we'll go over to this and you can see here, this is the URL and you do have to type in the HTTP, not S. HTTP colon slash slash pickpie dot hot spot. Go. There it is. Same bit of data. It's a little bit faster on here actually, which is fun. But we'll look up the same. Hey, see that? Apparently it's getting warm in there. The fan just came on. Let's see if you can hear that. So I've got that set to 30 degrees Celsius and I've got lights all over this thing. So it's probably a little warmer than it needs to be. Let's try this. Look at the same article. There's that. Let's see if we find the same picture or something. There's that picture. There it is. Same article. One of them's on Wi-Fi, as this is per providing access point. The other one's just right on the box in case you flush your phone down the toilet. So, there it is. And just in time, thank you fan for turning off. And to shut it down, since the other power switch didn't work out for me, We have the toggle switch to turn it on, and this green button here will just issue a shutdown, actually halt command, so it will get the Raspberry Pi into a completely shut down state. It still will be powered on, but then we just hit the switch. So let's give that a try. There it goes. I happen to know it'll take five or six seconds to be fully powered off. Turn that off, that turns off the fan and the Raspberry Pi and the display, everything that's kind of like the main switch. The only other feature that's in here is this is the charging port, which you can plug in your normal micro USB. Is that what that is? Yeah. And charge it and it'll charge the battery that's inside. When you're not using it, you need to be waterproof and everything and close it up. All buttoned up, ready to go camping. Right on. Well, that's all we have for today. As I was setting up the test platform, I ran into a couple of problems with power. It was a combination of the Pi Supply Switch version 1.1 and the power bank. The power bank seems to have some circuitry in it that will automatically turn on when it senses something being plugged in. My guess is that it's sensing current draw and that's what turns it on. The Pi Supply Switch version 1.1 has a relay on it that switches on when a button is pushed. Apparently, when that relay is off, normally closed, it's not drawing any power at all for the rest of the circuit. Closing the switch connection to activate the relay was not enough to tell the power bank to switch on. I just ended up replacing that with a toggle switch, and that was enough to turn on the power bank. As you saw, I also added a button to issue a shutdown command to the Pi so it will shut down gracefully. What would be important data for you to have offline? Let us know on the Element 14 community at element14.com presents. We'll see you next time, and until then, keep making.